Here is what we learned today from the, this weekend from these marches. All the hate in this country is on the left. All of it. All of it is on the left. Does that mean there's no hateful person on the right? Of course not. There are hateful people everywhere involved with every single philosophy. But there is a big difference between hateful individuals and a hateful philosophy because a hateful philosophy taints and uh, pollutes the minds of everyone it touches. And, it, you know, it's, it's like Christianity versus Islam. They want to attack Christianity, so they find some guy who goes out and maybe he does violence in the name of Christ. Does the Pope support him? No. Does a pastor support him? No. Does anyone in the Christian community, the mainstream Christian community, support violence in the name of Christ? Absolutely not. That guy is out there by himself, just a crazy loon, doing what crazy loons do. That says nothing about the philosophy. But when an Islamist goes out and commits violence, you can find plenty of mainstream Muslims who say, well, he may have gone too far, but... Well, you know, you know, I didn't approve of that, but you can find those guys. And that is something that the uh, decent Muslim community has to address. It has to say, no, wait, wait we're going to have to reform this. We've got a problem in our philosophy, in our mainstream. And that is what is happening on the left. Here's here's what happened. It was the anniversary of that demonstration in Charlottesville. Right. And the uh, woman was killed by one crazed right winger, an alt right winger who drove a car into him. So he's a crazy guy. And they said, we're going to commemorate this in Charlottesville and in Washington, D.C. And we're going to have the white uh, uh, unite the right. I think they, they called it. Nobody shows up for the white supremacy deal. Nobody. I mean, like 20 guys. So this is like, a, you know, it's like a handful of clowns pushing their. It's just identity politics, by the way. It's not something that the right wing approves of anyway. It's something the left approves of. It's a creation of the left. But let's say they associate themselves with the right. I'm going to accept them as as some kind of, uh, you know, part of the right wing. The left pours into both these places with Antifa. They are vile, violent, vile, ugly. There weren't that many violent incidences, but the cop got attacked. Reporters got attacked. The filth that was coming out of I mean, let's let's look at just what they were chanting. I mean, these are this is a mainstream part of this demonstration in D.C. They, they, let's just listen to what they're chanting. This is cut number four. No border, no wall, no USA at all. No USA. They want the USA wiped off the face of the map. They want it to disappear. That is that not hateful? Uh, yeah, I think that's hateful. If you said that about any other country, it would certainly be hateful. But that is that is mainstream. Well, l- let me put it another way. It may not be mainstream leftist thought, but the mainstream is on a spectrum with that and does not disapprove of it. Now let's listen to the speech by the uh, right wing guy. He is he describes himself as white identity politics. His name is Jason Kessler. He shows up to give the speech. It's pitiful, right? He's in this park. There's like you know, 20 guys there. You know, I mean, th- that's that's it. That's it. There's 20 guys there in favor of whiteness, I guess. Who knows what the hell they're in favor of? Listen to his speech. A lot of folks are deliberately misconstruing white identity politics today as something that's endorsing the KKK or neo-Nazis. And I think, in fact, there are a lot of people in the alt-right who are encouraging that by trying to be these cartoon Nazis and deliberately stupid and hateful. And I just got to say, I mean, I thank the alt-right to some extent for waking me up to the fact that my people had a voice and had people who were going to stand up for them. But I got to say, a lot of the jokes just aren't funny anymore. Give it a rest. We got to be honest. We got to be sincere. Uh, There is a way forward to help white folks, but we cannot be uh, associating with hate or violence or oppression. So even the white supremacist is against white supremacy. Even he, even the, this guy is preaching against hatred and the white, it's not, a, you know, he calls it white identity politics. Fair enough. You know, that's what he wants to call it. Even he is preaching against what the left is preaching against. Why is one side emboldened to go chanting down the street, destroy America? Why is one side emboldened? And the other guy is basically tied in knots preaching against his own supporters. Why is that? 
It's because one is a fringe group. The white supremacy people are a fringe group. If you want to attach them to the right, they are way out there. Look, go ask Ben Shapiro what he thinks about white supremacy. Go ask the most right-wing politician you can find, Ted Cruz, Mike Lee, Louis Gohmert. Go ask him. Go ask him. Are they going to give him any credence at all? Are they going to say anything at all that supports them? No. But if you ask the people on the left about these guys, you know, CNN, talk about, we'll talk about leftism. CNN has a has the, what do they call it, the lower third now? They call it the lower third, where it just says anti-hate groups demonstrate. Do we have a picture of that? Underneath the, the demonstrations of the left, the anti-hate groups show up. The, Wall, uh, the Washington Post says the same thing. Anti-hate groups show up as right-wing, you know, uh, white supremacy rally fizzles. Anti-hate groups. So Benny Johnson of The Daily Caller went out and asked these anti-hate groups what they would do if they came in touch with Donald Trump. Here's cut number five. What would you do if Donald Trump showed up at the Trump? Murder him? Murder him for the people? How about you, man? Man, I'll tell Trump to get on the the floor and scrub those toilets himself. Because he doesn't know how to clean. He needs to learn. He needs to learn how to clean? Scrub some toilets? Yeah. Murder him. I mean, yo, he's America's Caesar except he's a dead. So, you gotta take him down. Trump! 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 If it came down to it and it was a group effort, We'd have to do him like Gaddafi. Like Gaddafi? Yeah. What would you do if Donald Trump showed up? Yeah, no, I'm a wild out. I'm You'd wild out? out? Yeah. Yeah? I would him. up. You'd him up? Yeah. To be honest, if I get a tattoo, I would do that. What's that? If I get a tattoo, f*** him up, I would. Chance to f*** him up? You would. Yeah. yeah. Looks like you <laughs> Looks like you. You got a system right there. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> All right. Nah, you better stay, stick nah, away. Nah, 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 nah. Yeah. Hey. How about you? What would you do? I would just, i smack him. Smack him? Yes. By the way, Benny Johnson, uh, this is, he was the interviewer from the Daily Caller. He's reporting now that the Secret Service is none too happy with some of these threats to murder the president. That's what they're talking about. They're out there talking, they're out there spewing this hate, right? These are anti-hate groups, we're told. They're anti-hate groups. So basically, I mean, this is a country of what, 350 million people? So basically in this country, they could find around 200 white supremacists. I'm sorry, but that is not an issue. That's not a problem, right? And who, and who's to blame for all this? Donald Trump. Here is Chuck Todd explaining why Donald Trump is to blame. Look, I think we are in uh, a pretty divided place today. I mean, I think we are probably more racially polarized today than we were a year ago. And as for the president, since Charlottesville, think about the biggest fight he's picked since Charlottesville. The anthem protesters yep. with the NFL and African-American players kneeling there. Uh, it, it's so I don't think if the president has, quote, learned anything, I think in his mind he has seen that this is an effective political strategy to keep his base his base. But I could tell you pretty much every other Republican who has to be on a ballot in 2018 believes this is that this is at the core of the Republican Party suburban voter problem, Mm. right? That it is the president's um, continuation of using, um, to be generous, dog whistles. Uh, If Trump is using dog whistles, where are all the haters? Where are the white supremacists? Well, isn't that the way a dog whistle works? You can't hear it. Only only the highly trained ears of Chuck Todd can hear the racism. Only the, the mythology created by the press can hear this racism that's going on. But where are all the dogs if these are dog whistles? You know, on the left, on the left, you have Maxine Waters and Barbara Lee and Danny. These are all Congress people, right? These are Congress people. Andre Carson, Keith Ellison uh, from New York, Gregory Meeks from Al Green. They're all going to Louis Farrakhan rallies. They're all supporting Louis Farrakhan, every single one of them. They're all of them going to his rallies. You see them hugging him, clapping him. Let's, let's listen to Louis Farrakhan for a minute. I wonder, will you recognize Satan? I wonder, will you see the satanic Jew and the synagogue of Satan, which has many races in it? Because Satan has deceived the whole world. Think about the message that I was blessed by God to give you today. No, 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 no. 
think about what they're going to say. when they have been so thoroughly and completely unmasked. Whenever you read that God has told the Jews to hear and obey, and they say, I hear and I disobey, that's Satan. Openly, disobeying God. He's talking about the Jews. He's talking about the satanic Jews, the satanic synagogue. That's what he's talking about. He's not banned from Twitter. Alex Smith, uh, Alex Jones is banned from Twitter, but not Louis Farrak Farrakhan. He's posting that stuff saying, let's look at my takedown of the satanic Jews. That's what he's saying. And, and where, you know, where are the right, where are the right wing congressmen showing up at white supremacist rallies? Where are they? Where are they? Where are the right wing congressmen? They don't exist. But the New York Times does. The New York Times supports identity politics. They've got Sarah John on their editorial board who hates white men. Why, you know, why is it wrong for this poor Jason Kessler to get 20 people together to celebrate white men if they can have on their editorial board this hateful person? You know, the New York Times is Alec Jones. They are Alex Jones. They support the lies and the hate and the conspiracy theories with their Russian collusion. Their op-ed is one attack on Trump after another. They are Alex Jones. You work for the New York Times. You work for Alex Jones. The people you are with are Alex Jones. They're not banned. Their hate, hatred isn't banned. And all the hate, all of it philosophically, all the philosophical hate is on the left. The hatred of America, the hatred of people who don't sign on, the determination. I mean, the reason they call Trump a racist. And as I've said, I, you know, you've heard me pick on Trump a lot, but I've never said he's a racist. I don't think he is a racist. I think he's helping people in, in tough neighborhoods. He's been doing it from the beginning. The reason they call him a racist, though, is he doesn't toe the leftist line. And that's their whole routine. Let, let me just read to you. <laughs> let me just read to you the New York Times description of what happened, right, called rally by white nationalists was over almost before it began. Right away, why is that the headline? Why is that the headline? Why isn't violent Antifa, Antifa takes to the streets, violent leftists take to the streets in anticipation of white rally? Why isn't it that? Why isn't that the, the the line? That doesn't come in until graphs down, long graphs down, the, before they start to mention that. Here's the. Let me just read the opening. After weeks of hype. White supremacists managed to muster just a couple of dozen supporters on Sunday in the nation's capital for the first anniversary of their deadly rally in Charlottesville, Virginia, finding themselves greatly outnumbered by counter protesters, police officers and representatives of the news media. But even with the low turnout, almost no one walked away with the sense that the nation's divisions were any closer to healing. This is the same thing. As Where's the division? Where's the division? It's hateful leftists. There are hateful leftists. There are large numbers of hateful leftists who hate the USA, who says no USA at all. There are where's the division? Where's the division? There's there's no there's no like left hateful leftist and then a massive bunch of white supremacists on the other side. If there were, where the hell were they? Where are they? You, you know, produce them, produce the evidence. Almost no one walked away. How do they know almost no one walked away? Maybe a lot of people walked. I walked away thinking, well, that's not a problem. Obviously, our problem in America is not white supremacy. It's obviously not. He goes on, he says, in Washington, the mere threat of another large turnout from the far right, coupled with a large turnout from the far left, among them hundreds of black clad, masked and helmeted anti-fascist protesters known as Antifa, seemed to indicate that the United States was not over its turn toward European style politics by street protest. So that's <laughs> that's essentially saying that that it's like, you know, it's like 1930s Berlin and the left and the right are taking to the streets and battling each other. But where's the right? Where's the right? wing hate. It doesn't exist. It's only all the hate is at the New York Times. It's at the New York Times where they're sitting in their editorial board with a woman who thinks white men should die, with a woman who thinks everything in America is bad because of white men. That, you know, that is, they are, and, and, and they are now promoting journalistic dishonesty in their, in their uh, paper. Thomas Friedman, on Knucklehead Row. I forgot to load up the song <laughs> Knucklehead Row, but we have sing it to your sing it quietly to yourselves, and we will get to Thomas Friedman on Knucklehead Row, the op-ed page in the New York Times. 
He writes, some healthy soul searching is taking place in newsrooms across the country these days over whether the main mainstream media should be covering President Donald Trump's every tweet and rally. My answer, absolutely. It's the right thing for us to do professionally. And as this week's election results indicated, it's the right thing to do politically if you want to see a check on Donald Trump's power. It appears that it's the toxic lying, bullying, and unpresidential behaviors that Trump exhibits most in his rallies and tweets, which we in the media so incessantly cover, that is turning off the very moderate, best educated Republicans and suburban women that Trump will need to hold the GOP majority in the House, let alone get reelected. So bring on the coverage. In other words, he wants Trump covered you know, in detail because he feels it hurt him in the primaries. Remember in Ohio, uh, the Democrat almost won and almost is good enough for the Democrats. So he was saying that coverage is helping him. So he's saying we should cover, do what we have to do to get Democrats elected. That's what he's saying. Newsrooms across the country do what, what and by the way, listen to what he thinks is, is turning the tide. He says, I want every American to know that two Trump supporters were sp <laughs> This is a supporter with 10,000 people in it, right? I want every American to know that two Trump supporters were spotted at the president's last rally in Ohio wearing T-shirts that read, I'd rather be Russian than a Democrat. That's whom you're voting with when you vote for Trump. Those two guys, those two guys wearing joke T-shirts. They're wearing joke T-shirts against the Democrats. They're not shouting no USA at all. That's who you're voting for when you read Thomas Friedman. That's who you're reading when you read Thomas Friedman. Listen to Friedman. You know, Greg Gutfeld was uh, making fun of him, saying, yeah, go ahead, cover Trump. It worked really well for you last time. And uh, Friedman called uh, uh, Greg a, a moron. That's, that's the first thing he goes on. Now, just listen. He's with uh, Michael Smirkonish on CNN. And here's Thomas Friedman describing his strategy. But that's uh, the question I would ask is, how's it working in 2018? You see, what happened in 2016 was Donald Trump was running against Hillary Clinton. And there we know from the polling, there were a lot of moderate Democrats, uh, suburban women, independents. There were just enough that in a choice between Trump and Hillary, ready to say, really don't like Hillary, can't vote for her. I think I'll take a chance on Trump. What's been happening since uh, over the last two years? Trump's been locked at 43 percent approval, 40, 43 percent approval and around 50, 53 disapproval. And I think one of the key reasons for that, and we saw it in the uh, Alabama senatorial election. We saw it in the Pennsylvania by-election. Uh, we saw it in the in the recent uh, election in Ohio, is that um, that group of, of independents, moderate Republicans and um, uh, and others who are ready to take a chance on Trump versus Hillary are no longer ready to do so because they've got the proof of the last two years of his incredibly um, divisive and toxic behavior. So there is Thomas Friedman, putative journalist, supposed journalist, talking about how to cover Trump so you hurt him. How do you cover Trump so you hurt him? And now listen to the question Smirkonish asks him after this. So let me play devil's advocate. The polling data suggests that his standing among Republicans, I think the latest Gallup number is 89% approval. So where's the evidence of these moderate Republicans who are leaving isn't instead the explanation for both the Ohio 12th or the Pennsylvania special election, that there's great enthusiasm among Democrats, but not that Republicans are turning their back on the president. I don't think so. I think the polling, uh, I don't think you can explain that big a gap um, uh, in, in the Ohio election. A district, Michael, that has not sent a Democrat to Congress in over three decades, almost sending one now, let alone the Alabama election. I, I, I'm sure there is greater d Democratic enthusiasm. But by the way, let's say um, he's lost you know, he, he, he only has 89 percent. Let's say he has 80 percent among Republicans. He just narrowly won those states. So those are two journalists discussing. The other guy said, I'm playing devil's advocate. He didn't say I'm playing devil's advocate. Maybe we should just tell the truth. Maybe we should just report the news. Maybe we should hire some guys who support Trump. So we get the, uh, that's playing. Devil, that would be playing devil devil's advocate. Right. He's not playing. He's saying maybe it won't work. Maybe it won't work. Maybe there's another way. How do we hurt him best? How do we hurt? They're on TV discussing this. And then, you know, Brian Stelter is going to come on and say, no, 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 we cover everything straight. They're on television discussing how journalists can report the news in such a way that it hurts Donald Trump. Where is this stuff on the right? Where is the hatred on the right? I mean, where, you know, cops were beaten up by these Antifa jerks, you know, reporters. Was it NBC? NBC, I think, or ABC had an affiliate's 
uh, audio cable cut and they're screaming at the reporters. They're screaming to get your mic out of my face and all this, all the, you know, the foul language that they're using constantly. Hey, here, play it. Go ahead. Don't be shoving on people. What's wrong with you? Yeah, and get that out of my face. Hey, 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 to lick boots? Yo, link up around here. Link up around here. I got it. Come here. Come here. Hi. Okay. I'm his side. Hi, guys. I'm his side. Man. <laughs> he cut his audio. They put out a statement that that was unacceptable. They didn't cover it. They didn't put it out on the news. You know, who, who doesn't want to be seen by the press? Who doesn't want to be seen by the press? The people who are doing stuff that's wrong. Who doesn't want to be on camera? Who wants to cut your audio feed? You know, why? And by the way, the cops, the cops who exercised restraint, having these foul people you know, foul mouth them and didn't beat the living daylights out of them. Good for them. Good for the police. But they're 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 my hero for their my heroes for their restraint in dealing with these clowns. But where is this stuff? Where on the where on the right do you hear people saying we should cover the news so that we hurt the left? Where do you hear that? You don't even hear it on Fox. You don't hear Brett Baer saying that saying that he plays it. He plays it straighter than any newsman on television. I do not understand. I do not understand why people go to work at The New York Times knowing it's a hate filled, dishonest paper where their top op ed guy is uh, saying that they should lie or do whatever they can to destroy an opposition candidate. I don't understand where there's any honor in that. I don't understand how, where, where, how you feel how you respect yourself if you work for an organization like that. I mean, it is just, it is just amazing. All the hate, all the dishonesty is on the left, and yet it's the right who's getting censored. It's the outlier, like Alex Jones they're worried about, instead of worrying about the true, true radicals like the New York Times and CNN. 